But I am going to talk about wisdom today. And in your news sheet, there is uh, some notes. I don't know whether you can get just a bit more volume out of that for me. Thanks, Joy. Turning 60, my hearing is a little less than what it was. <laughs> Thanks. Not too much. That's fine. How to be extremely wise. It's one thing to be wise. It's another thing to be extremely wise. Of course, you might have bumped into people that you would put in that category. Very wise people, extremely wise people. And today we're going to um, have a look at how to be extremely wise. And we're going to learn from the ant. We're going to learn from a little creature called a rock rabbit. We're going to learn from, a, uh, from locusts. They get a bad rap, locusts, but today they're getting a good rap. And we're going to learn from the lizard or the spider. Explain why that's the case when we get there. But the Bible says a lot about wisdom. In fact, um, you look at right in the middle of the Bible and you've got the wisdom books. Of course, the book of Proverbs. And uh, in your notes, you can take it home and, and read many of the scriptures I've written there. But there's great emphasis on getting wisdom. The Bible says it's the principal thing. It's the most important thing. If you get wisdom, you're going to have life. If you don't have wisdom, it's not going to work out too well for you. The Bible says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. In other words, if he is number one and you set your heart on following him, uh, if you're reverencing him and respecting him and putting him in his rightful place, allowing him to be Lord of your life, then you're on solid ground. You're going to begin to step into godly wisdom. It says that it's the most sought after treasure. In fact, it says that we should be willing to sell everything we have to get wisdom. So go after wisdom, the Bible says. And of course, the, that's probably a bit too loud now, Joy. Sorry, I don't know what's happening there with the sound. Thanks, Joy. I reckon sound people have, people have got hearts of gold and spines of steel. What do you reckon? They have to put up with cranky pastors. Turn it up, turn it down, too loud, too soft. So the Bible encourages us to get wisdom and, 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 and to go to great lengths to get it because when you get wisdom, well, we all know that that's a good thing. And so today I'd like to talk about being extremely wise or how to, how to get wisdom to that degree. And we're going to have a look at these little creatures. So come with me on page three of your notes and we're going to read the scripture together um, from Proverbs 30 verse 24 to 28. Four things on earth are small yet they are exceedingly wise. Other translations put it extremely wise. The ants are creatures of little strength yet they store up their food in the summer. The rock badgers sometimes called conies or rabbits, they're little rock rabbits, are creatures of little power, yet they make their homes in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet they all advance in formation. And the lizard or the spider, depending on how you read the particular word for that animal, can be caught in one's hand. The King James Version says, or it grasps with the hands. Yet it is found in the palaces of kings. So let's begin with the ants. It says the ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. And of course, this is a picture of advanced preparation. Advanced preparation. It's good to prepare for the future. Now I want to have a look at things to store up. Because as the scripture says there, it, 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 it indicates that they store up in the summer because winter's going to come. And who knows, we have the winters of life that come. And if you store up now, you'll have something for later, especially when the storms come. If you don't store up correctly now, then when the storms of life come, the cupboard's bare and you really struggle. In fact, when you think about our lives and the quality of our lives now, our lives are the result of how we have prepared in the past. That's a powerful concept that really should sit firmly in our thinking and in our hearts. That I am now a result of what I've done in the past. 
The quality of my life now is a result of all the sowing, all the storing up in a sense that I did all those years ago. And of course, when we all reflect on our lives, we know that we could probably have done it better. But when we think of that and we think that maybe I've got another season of life yet or two or three, it's important to realise that storing up now and sowing well now is so critical if I want to have a quality of life down the track. So here's some things to store up in our lives and these are pretty obvious but worth reflecting on. The first thing is the Word of God. Of course this brings us knowledge and wisdom. Jesus said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And in Proverbs chapter 3 and I've got the wrong reference there it's Proverbs chapter 3 and verse around 2021, 20, it talks about storing up the word in your heart. I don't think there's anything better to do than store the word of God up in your heart. There's a storehouse in there. Now you can fill it with negativity and unbelief and the you know, natural thinking and you can, you can fill it up with all kinds of knowledge, but the best thing to do is to fill it up with the word of God. In fact, here I am at age 60, one of the things that I've set my heart on is to spend more time trying to memorise scripture. I wished I'd memorised scripture a lot more when, I'm, when I was younger and stored the word up in that way. In fact, when you look at those uh, uh, boys in Israel, and Jesus would have been the same, they had to memorise great slabs of scripture before they turned the age of 14. No wonder Jesus was a man of the word. And I think there's a lost art today in memorising scripture and one of the things I've noticed, Richard, getting older, it's a little bit harder for me to memorise things. When I was younger, it was much easier. However, I'm trying to discipline myself to memorise scripture and I don't know about you, but the way I find it working for me is that I'll, I'll memorise a passage, then I'll move on to something else and then a little while later I've forgotten a lot of the first passage. But there's, it's amazing how the recall happens when you really need it. And when you store up the word, it stores up the living word of God, which is powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. It's life-giving. It's creative. It gives you wisdom and instruction and godly wisdom at that and enables us to know him and to know how to walk. And there's a power in the word, hallelujah, that gets released in our lives. So we need to store up the word and I guess I wouldn't, I'd, it'd be pastoral malpractice if at least once on a Sunday I didn't tell you to pick your Bible up and read it every day daily devotionals and I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago how's your daily devotional going how's that going I've always been inspired by Chris Snape he he preached last Sunday morning and comes to our evening service he gets up at 5 30 and spends time in the word before he gets into his busy day and I'm inspired by that. I, I'm encouraged by that. And I want to be more like that, where I'm just into the Word of God. It shapes your thinking. It gives you wisdom, helps you to know God. God speaks to you as you spend time in the Word. And it stores up something so that when the storms come, when the winter comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. Didn't Jesus talk about building a house on the rock? Remember the old, what's the old children's church thing, Megan? I can't remember it now. Build on the rock. Can't remember the words, but had the, even the children learned that. Build your house on the rock. Because if you build it on the sands, when the storm comes, your house will wash away. And what Jesus meant was obedience to the word of God. It's one thing to know it, it's another thing to obey it. But we've got to know it first before we can obey it. So the word of God, store that up. The second thing is good deeds. Matthew chapter 6, let's see if I've got the right reference there. Come over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
And in the Gospels, it records Jesus teaching like this and it refers to good works, good works, good deeds. And as we sow, we reap. We read that this morning from 1 Corinthians. If I'm sowing good deeds, I'm going to reap good deeds or the result and fruit of those good deeds. And what I've discovered is if you devote your life to doing good, then good comes back to you. Amen? So that's something we need to store up in a sense. And then there's giving and receiving. And we read that wonderful passage uh, this morning. Sowing. The seed goes into the ground. You can't see the fruit of it yet, but it comes up later. Isn't that a wonderful picture? We know it in our gardens and it's the same in the spiritual realm. It's the same even with finances. As I sow now, there's going to be fruit that comes later. I can't see the fruit yet, but I've sown in faith, believing as I give my tithes and my offerings and missions offerings or whatever it is, uh, gifts to people um, to glorify God, then at, later on there's going to be a harvest that comes from that. Not just for me, but for my family and for others. So there's that principle of storing up something in a sense, that storing up of good works so that there's fruit later on. Then there's friendship. Who knows you've got to work at friendship? You've got to, if you want friends, you've got to be a friend, don't you? I've heard people come to me over the years and say, I haven't got any friends. And I say, well, um, (laughs) why do you think that is? There's all sorts of reasons for some people. Um, I totally get that, that aren't always within their control, but um, I just have to realise that it's really worthwhile sowing into friendships and never take friendship for granted. I've known Roger Fitton and Margie for 25 years now and I, I, I really value that friendship and every now and, the, every now and then the Holy Spirit says, what are you doing to sow into that? So I go for a ride with Roger and I let him beat me on the ride. That's <laughs> sowing into the friendship. We spend time together and it's just something I felt to write down there because I think that we live in a society and right around the world at the moment where there's a growing pandemic of loneliness. And if only we would invest more into friendships, be a friend, study what it means to be a friend and don't wait for it to come to you because if that's your approach, it's not going to come, most likely. Be a friend. You know, one of my approaches to church, and I don't know where I got this from as a teenager, but I never came to church to get anything it wasn't on the radar nobody taught me as a young in my late teens that that's how you're supposed to think or some people think anyway that you come to church to get something no I just came to church to worship God and uh, they asked me to play French horn in the music department you know what a French horn is don't you it's this brass instrument I sort of (laughs) did that a bit and played drums and did whatever but I've never come to church to think oh I'm coming here to get friends I don't know where that comes from. It doesn't work. Come and be a friend. Just be a friend. And you've, what I've discovered is if you be a friend, you know what could happen? People might actually be friendly back. Now, you, you might think this is a bit basic, but I am concerned about people and their level of loneliness. And uh, you really have to be proactive. You can't play the victim and you can't... You can't um, What's that word? You can't have that sense of entitlement that I'm entitled to friends. No, it's hard work. You've got to work at building friendship and learn how to make friends. You know, and sometimes there's things that get in the way that um, have more to do with me than the other person. Have you, have you come to that realisation? After 60 years, I've had to realise that um, maybe I'm the problem. <laughs> I heard a little story, it might have been in the devotional I was listening to this morning, where a little girl was uh, sitting on Daddy's knee and, you know, praising him and, Daddy, I love you and you're fantastic, but Daddy, there's one thing I don't like about you, and that is you smell (laughs) bad. (laughs) Out of the mouths of babes. Now, I'm not talking about physical smell so much, but, you know, there might be things about us that smell a bit. So, Father, what is that? And God, can you show me? And maybe others need to speak into our lives as well. But friendship is something we need to store up. The other thing is good health. You can sow good health when you're young. And uh, diet, exercise, sleep, all of those things we know are very important because uh, the older you get, the harder it is to get that back, so to speak. And we all know that. I'm just putting things here to stimulate your thinking because it's not too late to start storing up for the future. Amen? And we've got to store up well. 
So that's the ants. We can learn from the ants. Little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer with the inference that they'll have in the winter. The next little creature is the rock rabbit or the coney or the hyrax or the rock badger. Take your pick. They're creatures of little power, yet they make their homes in the rocks. And to me, this is a picture of power and strength. And I want to ask you today, in what do you find your security? This small creature has little power and strength, but when hiding in the cleft of the rock, he is as strong as the rock. You can't get to that fellow because of the rock. And of course, it reminds me of Jesus. There is a rock. Psalm 61 verse 2 says, there is a rock that is higher than I. Do you remember that old chorus? Um, Hear my heart, O Lord, attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I love that song. I sing that in the shower, Megan. It sounds much better, I can tell you. But he's our rock, amen? And when we're hiding in him, we're as strong as he is. Of course, he's got to be Lord of our lives to do that. To, die, to hide in him, we need to follow him, love him, worshiping, worship him, honour him, and really enter into that life of relationship with him, where he is Lord and Saviour. Are we trusting in the rock of ages? And of course, we had that prophetic exhortation this morning to put our trust in him. Jesus is the very source of wisdom and of blessing. His presence and wisdom will energise us and give us strength. He'll help us to make wise decisions that will empower and enable us to live fully and fruitfully. And of course, we know he does that by his spirit within us. Ephesians 3, 20, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine according to his power that works within me. Amen. You've got the, turn to the person next to you and say, you've got the Holy Spirit. you got the power. <laughs> So we learn a lot from the little rock badger. Tiny creature, but he makes his home in the rocks for good reason. The locusts, as I said, they, they get so much bad press, but they're going to get some good press today. The locusts have no king, yet they are all advanced in formation. And to me, and uh, you, know, you can draw your own conclusions from the picture we see here in Scripture, but for me, it means protection and safety. Why is that? Because there's safety in numbers. Who are you travelling with today? Because who you travel with will determine the quality of your life and the level of wisdom that you have. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 verse 20, walk with the wise and you get wise. Probably add something to that too and that is that you've got to be teachable. (laughs) And I am so thankful, I am really thankful for the people that have been in my life over many, many decades. Um, I can start naming them, but I'm just so thankful for that because God brought me into the company of wise people, godly people who influenced my life. And that's why I plant my life smack bang in the centre of the local church. That's how I see my life. There's other aspects of my life, my family and workplace or whatever, um, community context, But in terms of my identity, I make sure I'm planted smack bang in the centre of the local church. Of course, that's got to be a a church that glorifies Jesus, teaches the word of God and, and, uh, you know, is, is a good, healthy local church. Apart from accepting Christ into my heart, this is the wisest thing I've ever done. And I attribute even doing that to the grace of God. I couldn't do that on my own. I was just a young teenager, didn't know anything from anybody. And I just had a drawing in my heart, God leading me to go to a church. And I went to a church. It's the best thing I ever did. But it was God leading me. It's his grace and his work in my life. Hallelujah. And I hope that my life says something of the wisdom gained from following the example and counsel of of godly believers in the church. Doing life with strong and wise followers of Jesus is an extremely wise thing to do. Amen? Going alone, that's a struggle. It's also a picture of unity, working harmoniously with others. 
and also of what can be achieved when people serve together as one. We see those locusts, they go in and they, they're pretty effective, aren't they? One can do a little bit, but a whole lot together in unity can have any, any serious impact on the environment. Of course, they're well fed. Working harmoniously with others, and it speaks of humility to learn from others as well. So that's the locust. And lastly, the lizard or the spider. And as I mentioned to you, um, depends on how you read that word. Scholars are a bit divided as to whether it means lizard or spider. However, there's similar characteristics in the context of this verse. It says the lizard or spider can be caught in one's hand or it grasps with the hands, as the King James Version says. Yet it is found in the palaces of kings. To me, this is a picture of promises fulfilled. What are you clinging on to or grasping onto in your life? You know, the spider and the lizard have a superpower. They're able to hold on in a way that takes them even into a palace, the place of royalty, which is normally only reserved for kings. They hang on, don't they? The spider is able to crawl around. You can't get to it, but it can get anywhere. In fact, how do those spiders get into your house sometimes? Have you noticed that? There's no doors open, there's no cracks, but there's a spider on the wall doing its thing. And sometimes the same with lizards. In fact, when you go into the tropics, and I'm sure Roger's experiencing this at the moment, um, you do see quite a few lizards, particularly the little geckos, you know, the little beautiful geckos, that, and they suction cap all around the place. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing when you speak and when you see them operating. To me, this speaks of holding on to the promises of God, and that is an extremely wise thing. In fact, when you hang on to the promises of God, it takes you into the presence of the King. Amen? Praise God. We know one day we'll all be at that marriage supper of the Lamb, Jeff. I know that's one of your favourite thoughts, marriage supper of the Lamb, when Jesus returns and we'll be reigning with him as royalty. All because God opened our hearts to the promises of God and we hung on to those promises and he made us a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Hallelujah, a new creation in him. So hang on to the promises, hang on to the promises. Father, I'm not letting them go. I don't care what my mind says sometimes. I don't care what the circumstances say sometimes. I'm going to hang on to your promises because you're faithful to your promises and you will bring them to pass in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. To me, this also speaks of using one's gifts wisely. Have you watched that gecko cling to the ceiling? That's a unique gift. In fact, if he didn't use that gift, he would not eat. When I go to Vanuatu, I'm sitting there and you can hear them at night time. It's a bit disconcerting at first. You wonder what it is, but it's the geckos and their noises that they make around the room and around the house. And in the daytime, if you catch a glimpse of them, you can watch them very slowly stalking an insect and they're clinging with this hand and they're clinging with that hand and they're using their gift so that they can eat and they ever so slowly get close to the insect and then all of a sudden this whopping big tongue comes out and goes like that lunch (laughs) they're amazing creatures you got to use what God has gifted you with In fact, you know the old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's a biblical principle. If we don't steward the talents and gifts that God's given us, he takes them away and gives them to somebody else. He says, well, why should I give them to you? You're not using them. And so we need to use, of course, God's very gracious to us. He's very patient, but he intends for us to use our gifts. So the question is, what gifts has God graced you with? And we use them in different contexts, in our families, in our workplace, in our local church, in the community, etc. If you use them well, that's extremely wise. It really is, because people need you. It's not just about you, it's about others and what they receive from you using your gifts. If you squander those gifts, then that is foolish. And of course, we know there are many promises around being faithful over all that God's entrusted to us. It talks about being richly welcomed into the kingdom of heaven, the parable of the talents, where those that did use the talents were welcomed into the kingdom. And and, and what what does the king say? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in. So there is that aspect 
of discipleship that God expects us to use what he's graced us with. And as we do that, we'll be richly welcomed into everlasting dwellings, heavenly places, places of royalty, just like the lizard into the very throne room of God. So to be extremely wise, we can be like the ant, the rock rabbit, the locust and the lizard, and we can learn a lot from them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Proverbs. We thank you that the Bible as a whole is an amazing book of wisdom. It's godly wisdom. And Lord, without it, we just don't really have wisdom at all in the end because we don't know you. But we thank you that, that we can know you through your word. And Lord, I pray for each one of us this year as we come into the greater part of the year that you'd help us to be wise and to store up well, to sow well now so that there's a, a good reaping later on, particularly when the winters come and the storms come. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be those who firmly plant our trust in you and like that little rock rabbit hiding in the cleft of the rock. Lord, we're, we're so vulnerable and exposed in our own. But in you, Lord, when we hide in you and when we put our faith and our trust in you, we're as strong as you are. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Help us to be like the locusts who, who understand the protection that comes from uh, the strength of numbers. And Father, help us to be wise with who we run with and who we walk with this year, that we would allow uh, people into our lives to counsel us and advise us and to, to live, do life with that are going to be a great encouragement to us and wisdom to us and help us to be that to others also. And Father, we thank you for the lizard and that little spider. We thank you for their unique gifts. We thank you that as we cling on to the promises of God and don't let go, Lord, you honour that. And Father, help us also to use our gifts wisely. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 There you go. You didn't thought you were going to come and hear about all that today, did you? Let's stand together, shall we? And we're going to close in some prayer. And Megan, if you could uh, come and lead us in a song. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you for your patience today. And I trust that that's been of help to you. You can close in prayer, Megs.
sola.